Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. I'm so looking forward to talking to you today. How are you? Doing well. Thanks so much for having me. How are you? I'm good. Well, I know we're going to have a great conversation. We were talking before we jumped on here. We're going to be talking all about attachment parenting and what that is and how to build connection with our tweens and teens. And I thought we would start uh, by you sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do and why you're passionate about what you do. Well, first of all, I'm just super glad to be here. And I, before I answer your question, I want to like make a small clarification because I think it's like super common for people to sort of confuse these things, which is attachment parenting versus attachment theory or attachment science. And I think it's really interesting because um, sometimes they get lumped together and attachment, the way I explain it is attachment science or the theory of attachments, like the umbrella idea. And then there's lots of different ways that you can take that interpretation of that theory and apply it to certain things. And so we apply the theory of attachment to psychology and to mental health. We apply the theory of attachment to certain types of parenting styles as well. So parenting, so attachment parenting is a very specific interpretation of the theory of attachment um, that's kind of rooted in, in Dr. Sears's work. Um, and it's very much about like, it's a, you know, meeting your kids needs in a very specific way. Um, but the important thing is that's not the only way to get a secure attachment relationship. So attachment theory actually is more of like a psychological and development theory uh, presented by John Bowlby who's a child psychologist and researcher in the 60s. And he basically says that the, that human beings are from birth biologically hardwired to form an attachment bond to their primary caregiver to increase their chance of survival. Mm -hmm. And so we as clinicians measure the quality of that attachment as secure or insecure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it's really talking about is the relationship between a person, two people, what, what's the quality? What's the quality of that attachment? And so there's tons of research in the field of attachment science on like, how do you develop secure attachments? And so one way that people try to infuse that into parenting and inform parenting is attachment parenting, but that's also a very specific way of doing it. And actually like, there's so many ways that one can parent a child um, that can foster secure attachment relationships with them. Um, that have, that don't follow that particular framework, if that okay. makes sense. Can you, yeah, can you give an example? Because that's really interesting. And uh, yeah, that's, that's in interesting to distinguish the two. So can you give, so if you say secure, um, if you say attachment therapy or parenting, are you leaving yourself out of the equation? Right. So while attachment parenting is like, basically the idea, and I'm going to probably get it kind of wrong because I don't know, actually, I don't follow it personally, so I don't know all the nuances of it, but attachment parenting is, it's a very, you know, high demand on the parent, which usually is opted in. They want it. They find joy in it, but it's a lot of like, you carry your child, a lot of baby wearing, a lot of perhaps co-sleeping or, you know, nursing for very long periods of time. And like, you, you can do all kinds of pieces of elements that might overlap with attachment parenting and not necessarily be attachment parenting. Like I, you know, nursed my child till she was two and a half, but I didn't follow attachment parenting. Like, it's not just when your kids are babies. This is never, it's never too late to learn how to become more securely right. attached. Right. And this is, I think, where I come in, right? This is the work that I do. Like, I'm very passionate about this like attachment theory and helping parents understand how do you create a secure attachment with your child and how to develop these like secure relationships within the family system. And that, that yeah. is really the core element of like, why is attachment theory important is because those core relationships and the security of those relationships in early childhood become a blueprint that the child uses throughout the rest of their life to predict how other people will respond to them, whether they will take care of them, whether they will feel safe with them, whether they, you know, and kids who have like, you know, 
whether it's because there was trauma or there was lots of separation or there was chaos in the early like relationships with their caregivers, um, you know, didn't create that secure attachment relationship, they might find that they're more anxious around, you know, a, a, they don't necessarily assume people are going to meet their needs or yeah. assume that they're going to respond in a safe way to them or assume that they're going to soothe them when they're when they're having a hard time. And so you get this, um, you can have different types of insecure attachment styles. Um, mm -hmm. but we, and, you know, there's, you can avoid intimacy and in relationships because you just really don't expect people to meet your needs. You can not be sure if people will meet them. So there's this sort of um, ambivalent attachment insecure style where you're like, come, come close, but don't come too close. And I, I think you'll help me, but I'm not really sure. So I, so there's like a, an approach and retreat kind of thing that happens in a secure mm -hmm. relationship. We expect to be reliably and consistently seen and soothed and um, made to feel safe with another person. They're going to meet our needs most of the time. We don't need to have our needs met all the time in order to develop a secure relationship with our parents. That's important because like, I think that's where we get into trouble as parents of thinking like, oh my God, I made one mistake and now my kid's never going to have a secure attachment. And that makes parents yes. very yeah. anxious mm -hmm. about like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. perfectionistic their parenting styles and that's not helpful either. So, you know, all of this is to say like, we, we know research is definitely showing us that secure attachment health in relationships is a predictor of all kinds of really important outcomes in in adulthood, you know, and throughout childhood and well into adulthood. But the reason why I made the distinction between attachment parenting and just understanding attachment and using that to inform the way you develop your relationship with your child, where you are helping them to feel safe and secure with you. Um, you don't have to attachment, you, have to, you don't have to practice attachment parenting to achieve that. Yes, I'm so glad that you explained it that way because I love attachment theory because it's not never too late, but it's funny. I was talking to Jen who works, works with me and I was saying, yeah, attachment parenting, we're gonna talk about it. And she goes, oh, like I did with my son where I carried him around. And I was thinking, that's eh, not what it was, you know, referring to, but it's, it's, I'm familiar with the attachment theory and how that's how we can, the lens that we can see the world through, yeah. how we can see ourselves and others in the world. Is this a safe place? Absolutely. And that yes. is the root of attachment theory. Yes. And from, and I didn't share with your listeners, like why I care so much about this, but I'm a <laughs> clinical psychologist and I work you know, with families and parents and children across the sort of family lifespan. So I work with perinatal um, populations, people who are, you know, pregnant or just had a baby to manage like maternal and parental mental health. I work with families of really young kids doing parenting support and helping parents sort of understand the building blocks of child development and how do you create these secure attachment relationships with your kids without burning out you know, which is, yeah. Yeah. is I think sometimes parents uh, misunderstand that the only way to have a secure attachment re relationship with my child is to, you know, to carry my child everywhere and meet every single need and never let them cry and never separate. And like, that's actually not, first of all, that's not attachment parenting. That's a really extreme version of attach of what in practice attachment parenting looks like. I don't want people who practice attachment parenting to be like, that's not what I did, because I get that. But I think people who don't understand what attachment parenting is or the difference from general using like the lens of the attachment relationship to guide your parenting, they think that it's kind of black or white. Like it's either I, I'm, I do everything for my kid and I never let them experience distress. And that's how they develop a secure attachment or I'm kind of screwed and I guess I'm not going to really pay attention to that piece and just kind of do what I've always done or how I was parented perhaps. And I think there's, it's a really unfortunate misconception of the role that attachment plays in all of our relationships all the time, because every single relationship has an attachment. The question mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. what's the quality of that attachment? How you, all of us have attachment styles because we've 
have a, had a collection of relationships in our lives and we tend to show up in certain ways and the ways we tend to show up often are informed by that early blueprint that I was talking about, that like early relationship I had with my primary attachment figures. And, but, but it's not fixed. It's not like you can't change it. I know that's hopeful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, why would you bother going to therapy if you couldn't change attachment structures? Like yeah. the way, a lot of what I do in therapy with people is help them understand, like, if you understand why you anticipate a relationship being a certain way or what, or maybe unconsciously are showing up in relationships in a certain way, perhaps it is because you have a blueprint where you, it was informed, which was informed by a relationship where you didn't really feel seen or your attachment figure couldn't really help you to feel safe with them. And, and it's not because they necessarily were trying to make you feel unsafe, right? It could be that they missed the mark or there was, mm-hmm. you know, they were going through something like that made them unable to meet your needs. You know, if you have postpartum depression or if you had a parent who had postpartum depression, And they really were not able to emotionally meet your needs for long periods of time. Like if it was like very untreated postpartum depression, Mm -hmm. um, you might not assume that you're going to get your emotional needs met. You might learn to kind of figure it out on your own and not, not, not rely on other people to take care of your emotional needs. And conversely, if you had a parent who's a very, very anxious, intrusive parent, not because they wanted to be mean to you, but because the, your distress was really, really scary to them. And so every time you felt distress as a child, your parent would try to turn it off. Like, ah, don't, don't cry. Like, mm-hmm. stop. You're fine. Everything's good. Good, good, good. We're stop good. It. Stop it. Right. right? <laughs> then you may actually not feel that soothed and seen and safe with that parent, not because they didn't love you or didn't try their best with what tools they had in that moment, but because they were so flooded with their own anxiety. And they were so dysregulated when you would become dysregulated that they weren't able to emotionally meet your needs of like helping you regulate and feel safe. And so you have a slightly more anxious attachment style, like, a, uh, you know, not being totally sure which yeah. parent to get. Mm-hmm. the one that can meet my needs or the one that's terrified by my needs. And so you kind of, that in, that's the blueprint, right? So, but if we can understand why we have the blueprint we have, And we can do work, that personal work of kind of changing our blueprint, having corrective emotional experiences with other people in our lives and saying, wow, you know, there are my, my, I can get my needs met. Um, People are safe. I can be soothed and understood by the world and have, you know, have these mutually rewarding relationships that feel really secure. Then our attachment style and our attachment patterns will change likely over time. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, you know, because how I ended up starting Moms of Tweens and Teens was my oldest is 32 now, but when she was really struggling as a tween, that was when I really started, the wheels started coming off and took her to therapy and thought, oh, you know, I'll fix her. And in that process, when they bring you in, (laughs) I'm like, "I, I think that I need the help here. And I ended up getting in an, a group that was called an assignment group. And it's exactly what you're saying, where we worked on this and we healed. It was so powerful because there are other people and we were working on these things and healing those, those wounds and, and being able to um, get what we didn't, you know, heal those things that we did not get. And, um, and so I'm a huge believer in groups and community and that there's hope. So I love what you're saying that if there's, um, moms or caregivers, whoever's listening and you feel a lot of despair, it's like, it's never too late that we can learn and we can, and we can heal and we can do it differently with our kids. Yeah. Yeah. And when we do that learning and that healing, there's a a ripple effect with children, because I always kind of say, like, I always describe the family system kind of like a, I call it like a spider web because it's this interconnected web. And like, if you pull one thread of a spider web, the whole thing moves, right? So if you, the parent 
are shifting the way you show up in your relationships within the family system because you're healing and becoming more aware of what my triggers are and why that's why I'm having these reactions and why this makes me, you know, hot and emotional or reactive or why I'm less patient with this kind of dynamic with my kid. Um, and I start to understand what about it is between me and my kid? And maybe what about it is between me and maybe my mom or other relationships that have taught me to show up in that way? Um, and we shift that. Well, then our relationship with our kid is inherently going to shift a little bit too. And they may actually get a little bit healthier too. Yes. We're all connected. We're all in these dances all the time. And so if we're always finding ourselves doing the same dance over and over with our kid, if we st- stop dancing in that way, our kid will sync up with us too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In that way also. So it feels good to be seen by your parent. If you can figure out a way to see your child fully in a moment, instead of having it be, I am kind of, there's, there's like a, a lens in my way, you know, a blinder I have to seeing my kid in a particular moment because I'm so triggered by stuff that has nothing to do with my kid, but my kid's activating it in me. Yes. Deal with that in a way that allows me to move that out of the way, out of the space between me and my kid. And now I can just see my kid in this moment and not be, not have like a young, like an older part of me kind of get interrupt this like relationship. Um, Then my kid's going to feel more seen by me. I'm going to meet my kids' needs for emotional attunement more effectively. Um, I'm going to be more regulated. So I'm going to share my calm with my kid, even when they're upset, and that's going to regulate them. And all of a sudden, our kid who's been maybe having a struggle with something going on is perhaps going to benefit from us doing our own work in a meaningful way. Yes, yes. Um yeah, so so important and true. And how would you how would you speak to the listeners if they're relating to okay, I get triggered and I really think it's like oh, if only my kid would change, if only my teenager would stop talking back and doing what they're, you know, doing this irritating behavior or if only they would start studying because they don't seem to care about their their work. Mm-hmm. And so they're triggered and they're continually, I run across this so often, getting in, in constant power struggles and constant fights. What would you say to that parent? Well, first I would say, I get it. <laughs> I get why that's frustrating, right? Like it makes sense that when your kid repeatedly ignores you or actively defies you or doesn't do something that you know they should be able to do, right? They, ha- I know you have the skills to do this thing and yet you're just not doing it, right? It's very frustrating. Yes, yes. And I also think we put tremendous pressure on ourselves in our society. And that's a whole nother podcast for another day of like the way that our society pressures parents to have children who are well-behaved and follow instruction and cooperate. And that is such a, unrealistic expectation developmentally for, I don't care if you've got a two-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 17-year-old, none of those three age groups cooperate all the time. And they, there is a, and the reason why not, well, there's many reasons why, but a big reason why is because their brain development is not done happening. You know, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that is response, the big, you know, big frontal lobe that we have behind our forehead, that is responsible for rational thinking, problem solving, inhibition of impulse, asking for what we need, making plans, you know, organizing regulation. (laughs) Yeah. Stuff. And you know. I joke because I do a lot of work with parents of really young kids. I also work with a lot of parents of teens and with teens themselves. And I, um, in my, in my clinical practice, and, um, I always joke that like toddlers and teens have a, have a lot of in common from a brain perspective because their, their frontal lobes are under construction in that 
period of life. Like in toddlerhood and adolescence is when the bri- the prefrontal cortex goes through the most significant overhauls of development. And so they're kind of, you know, they don't always have great access to that part of their brain that is that we want them to that's the part that we really want our kids to be able to access, right? Because that's responsible for the cooperation and the listening and the, you know, not fighting with your siblings and the getting your homework done and not getting into power struggles. But it's also developmentally a time when they have the least amount of access to that part of their brain because it's just going through so much change. And so I think we have unrealistic expectations of parents as a society to manage their child's behaviors to yeah. be responsible for their child's behaviors and also parents it kind of goes it gets translated into the parent child relationships where parents have un, oftentimes don't really understand about what's a developmentally appropriate expectation of of a kid even in teens um and older kids and it doesn't mean that they we never have expectations of them or that we, we should never expect them to be able to do those things of course they should especially teenagers they they really are able to, but not all the time. Mm-hmm. When they're dysregulated, mm-hmm. their prefrontal cortexes are offline. And so we have to understand that in order to help a child to do the things we want them to do, they have to be regulated. They have to feel safe. Their amygdala, which is their threat detector, um, constantly scanning the environment for threat, always. It's in us. This is true for all brains. Um, if it perceives threat, it's going to pull the fire alarm and their prefrontal cortex is going to go offline until the amygdala has been sort of assuaged and 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 like determines, okay, there's no threat here. So the fastest way to get your kids to cooperate if they're in a really bad mood or if they're agitated or if they're frustrated or um, if they're in any way like dysregulated is to help them feel safe. And we do that by helping them feel seen and validated and understood. It doesn't mean we don't have any limits or boundaries on behaviors, but we do want to let them know we see them. Their feelings make sense to us. You're safe here. Yeah, first, right? Yeah. And then once they're regulated again, we can go back. You got to go back. You got to do the actual other piece, which is the teaching part, right? Hey, you know, when they're calm and connected and in a good mood, that's when you go back and say, oh, you know what? Yesterday, when you came home from school and we had that fight over the homework, you know, first of all, I'm sorry I lost my cool. I get, you know, I realize now that like you probably were tired and didn't really want to talk about homework right then and there. But also when you, you know, gave me the finger and slammed your door in my face, that that really doesn't work right? Like, I want to help you. I don't want to nag you. I don't want to fight with you. So what could we do differently next time? Like, how can we address the homework situation differently? What would feel good to you? So so we're collaboratively problem solving. Um, we're, we're acknowledging our role in things. We're validating their per- their perception and their needs and their feelings. But we're also saying like, you can't do that. Like, you can't flip me off and slam your door. And you also can't not do your homework, but let's, let's look at that as like you and me versus this problem together versus now I'm going to get into a power struggle over like in the moment they're pissed in the moment. You're not going to be able to reason with them in the moment. Yeah. I think that's hard to remember because you get triggered as a parent and then you're operating out of that heightened emotional state. And then, like you said, they're scanning. It's like the perfect storm. And then you're nagging, you're on their back and you're off to the races and you never get anywhere. So I love that example you gave because you can always go back and repair it and own your piece Mm-hmm. I always say, don't fall on your sword because we, we all make mistakes, but you can go back and own it and then redo it. And yeah. that is a great script for parents to be able to say, hey, you know, yesterday, I'm sorry I lost it. And then and then be able to revisit it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's what, I think what's where people kind of get tripped up, tripped up a lot. And I again, I see this with parents of really little kids and I see this with parents of older kids is like, 
we think that all the parenting has to happen in the moment that this, you know, stuff's going down. And then we feel really bad about ourselves if we kind of flubbed it in that moment or the outcome didn't work. But then we kind of just like, all right, I'll try it again next time in a different way. But really what we, what's, what's more useful, I think, is to know, like you get to parent at any point about a particular issue. You don't, you're not limited to just this window of time when something is happening to parent about it. In fact, that's usually the least effective time to do the quote unquote parenting part, which is in my opinion, like the teaching and the guiding and the expectation setting and the relationship building, right? That stuff very rarely works in the heat of the moment when kids are yeah. angry and frustrated and dysregulated or when we are angry and frustrated and dysregulated. So in those hot moments, I say, make sure everyone's safe, right? You have to kind of safety first, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if it's not a safety issue, don't teach in those moments. It's yeah. not going to work. And mm -hmm. it's just going to re-agitate what's already inflamed. Give space. Or if your child will tolerate it, co-regulate, which means kind of like use your calm nervous system and energy to, to like validate their position and share some calm, like reestablish that sense of safety. That works best when it's like a small, like clash, right? Like, so like if your kid is on their phone at the table and they're, you know, you ask them politely to, to turn it off and they yell at you and like blow up a little bit. And then they come back down really quick and they're like, you know, they realize perhaps that I'm not going to win this argument and this isn't going to go very well. And they just kind of reconstitute. Then you could say like, oh, that made you really mad that I told you to turn your phone off. I wonder if, you know, you, there's something else going on, like, because that's not typically like you. Like, so you're seeing the good, you're seeing like the, you're seeing your kid in there, right? And you're trying to pull them out and say like, I'm not going to get into this power struggle with you. And I'm not going to like fan the flames of this either by getting just as angry. But then I also think afterwards, so you can, you can regulate in the moment if you can, if you can't, and they storm off and lock themselves in their room, like let them cool off. That's not the time to go banging on their door and like win this argument. They, right. they might need space to cool off. But then I think what we sometimes forget to do is go back to it. We have to go back to it when mm -hmm. it's calm and connected and they're in a, we're reconnected in that safe part of our relationship. So maybe we're, and it doesn't have, wait, wait, they'll remember yeah. that they blew yeah. up mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be like an hour later. It doesn't have to be the same day. Wait for a moment when they're genuinely feeling like themselves again and are feeling good with you. And that's when you go back and say, Hey, the other night at dinner. Something was really bugging you, huh? Like what was going on? And so we're we're sort of describing the situation from a non-judgmental place, from a place of looking for their best intention, where were they maybe struggling to stay regulated? Something might be assuming that something's going on for them, not just that they're being an a-hole. And, yeah. then, and then validate that. Like, oof, it was a hard moment. It didn't feel good, huh? And and you can, if you did lose it, you know, acknowledge that and take responsibility for that. But then you go back and say like, what can we do differently? Cause that didn't work so well. You know, like, I think what you wanted in that moment was to be able to like get something you wanted accomplished, right? You wanted to finish the thing you were doing on your phone. Right. Um, and that was not, you know, that, that was at odds with the rules of the dinner table. So how do we help them get what their needs are met? Like, how do we help them get their needs met? You know, if you have, a, if you're in the middle of a conversation with a friend and, and I say it's time for dinner, can you say, mom, I really want to finish this conversation with my friend. Can I have two more minutes? Um, or can I say to my friend, hey, I really want to finish this conversation with you, but I have to go to dinner. Can we reconnect in an hour? Um, so you're using your planning skills and your language skills and your problem solving skills to try to get your needs met. Um, we want to help our coach our kids how to do that. And we want to let them know that we're a safe person to do that with. And it's not just like, a, there's no phones at the table. And so you don't get your phone for a week. And I'm not having a conversation that teaches you what to do next time. So the yeah, teaching, more punitive. Yeah. 
the teaching has to happen, but it can't, I think people think if I can't teach them in the moment at the table, then I've failed as a parent. Yes. Discipline effectively in this moment. Like I just let them do whatever they want and I'm not good at, like I am a pushover. That's going to make me way more dogged next time my kid pushes a limit with me because I'm going to be, again, triggered that part of me that feels like, damn, I really don't know how to parent effectively. And now I really have to get bigger and stronger and more powerful. It's going to show up because we feel helpless in that moment because we keep trying to do the right thing at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Trying to do the right thing at the wrong time. And don't you, you talk a lot about how we as parents can can put so much pressure on ourselves for our kids to be well behaved, to perform, to be successful, whatever that looks like to us. And and I see this a lot working with parents as well, that when their behavior in that moment, we are judging it as bad. Now, Mm -hmm. of course, sometimes they're not the best choices, right? But we're seeing it very black or white. And we better do something about this behavior right now to change it. Because if I don't change this, I am therefore not a good parent. And how well my kid is doing is dependent on me. And do you see that a lot? I mean, it seems to be to me that that can be such a driving force. We really have to get out of the way is when you're describing what happens there that's so much more effective. We have to set ourselves aside for that moment so we can be curious about like, I love how you say, I've never heard it said this way, what's under the hood? You call it like, what's really going on underneath their behaviors in order to truly seek to see your kid and be on their side versus against. Seems like so often we're fighting against Right. Or we find ourselves stuck in that pattern, even though that was never our intention. Like no parents, like I'm taking my kid down today, you know, like that's what we want to be. We, if I pulled a hundred parents on the street and asked them, do you want to be on your kid's side? I would say 99% of them are going to say, yeah, I want to be. Sometimes it feels really hard to be, but I want to be. And so, but then all of a sudden we find ourselves, especially with power struggles, we find ourselves like forced in opposition to that yes it feels so helpless and it feels so frustrating and it makes them dig in more it makes us dig in more and then we get stuck in these places where it's like oh, I set a limit and now I can't undo the limit but they're not listening to the limit and now I just feel like I'm undermining my authority and so I'm getting more angry and the more angry I get the more like we've created a monster of a situation And I often say, like, sometimes we end up accidentally pouring gasoline on their fire and it just makes the problem worse. And I do think, you know, as parents, we have to like kind of step back a little bit and reassess, like, what is my goal here? Yeah. Is it to win this power struggle and be right? Because I am right. Most of the time we're probably right, because guess what? Our prefrontal cortexes are done with development, our ability to think rationally and forecast and inhibit impulse and be logical with all these things. Like that's pretty developed. It stopped, you know, we got it at about 25, 26, we were done. We were fully, our brains were done developing. So we have a ton more ability than our teenagers to stay rational, even when we're emotional, although it is hard to do that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But when we look at our kids being so irrational, it can be dumbfounding and it can be so infuriating because again, we're forgetting developmentally what's an appropriate expectation. And again, I say this because I think it's important. It doesn't mean we don't have expectations of our kids and we let them do whatever they want because their brains aren't done developing. But I think it's important, like we were saying, like it a part- you can't look at the at a behavior as representative of the child. You have to look at a behavior in a very specific context. This behavior is happening right now under these particular circumstances in this moment in relationship to me. Why? What's going on for my child in this moment? Mm -hmm. And I think when we come at behavior from that vantage point and say, there's a reason why this is happening and see our good kid under there, 
having a really hard time in this moment to do the thing we'd like them to do or to stay calm or to be kind or to plan well and make good, make good decisions. It might be because, and usually is, because the part of their brains required for those things are not accessible to them right now. It's not gone. They have those skills, which is why it's super frustrating because we're like, you did this yesterday. Why can't you do it right now? But if their prefrontal cortex is offline in this particular moment, we've got to get it back online to have these expectations met. Yeah. And we forget that they're learning. Like, I think that we just expect them to be like adults already. And we forget like, you know, and of course we mean, well, like you were saying, because we love our kids so much, but we forget like they are also work in progress. And so are we. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important for me, I know, with my kids to have, you know, and, and still, even though they're older, to remember that, like, we're all works in progress. Yeah. And a lot of times we learn from making mistakes. <laughs> and they're going to have to make a lot of mistakes. And that's okay. That's not a reflection of us. Yeah. And that deep, like, depersonalizing it, right? Like, yeah. not a reflection of me. This is my, and sometimes my kid has to make these mistakes to really learn it. I could, if I'm constantly preventing them from making mistakes because I'm always stepping in and intervening and fixing the problems and yelling at them until they get it done and making sure it happens, you know, you're going to have a kid who, once you're not there, doesn't really know how to solve these problems for themselves or tolerate the disappointment that may come from not getting an outcome they desired because they didn't put the effort in or they didn't figure it out. They didn't, they didn't have to problem solve. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we have to remember like, yeah, what's my bigger goal is my bigger goal to have my kid not struggle. And my bigger goal is to have my kid um, get everything done the way I'd like it to be done. Okay. That, that's a, I get why we think that might be her goal, but I, I would challenge a parent who's saying, yeah, I think that's my goal to say, in fact, in reality is perhaps your goal to have a child who knows how to do these things, who can tolerate frustration, who can tolerate distress, who can tolerate disappointment when things don't go the way they do, that can can try again when they fail, that can get creative with their ability to pivot and problem solve. Because if we want that, if we want these like resilient, gritty, perseverant children, um, we're going to have to step out of the way and prevent and like not prevent all negative outcomes from occurring because we think we're supposed to. Yes. Yeah. So good. And it's so important to be, but it's, it's hard. I think a lot of times when we have tweens and teens, we have to manage our own anxiety in order to let them do that. Yeah. You know, in order and just know, I love how you said, take the long view. You know, in that moment, we might have a goal, but is that really going to serve them in the future? Right. Like I could have a power struggle with my kid and yell at them about their homework every single night. But that, and, and I know this isn't true for all children, but the vast majority of kids who like, you know, they forget to turn in the homework that they, that they worked on and they get a bad grade or they, you know, chose to do something else instead of doing an assignment and they get a bad grade, like they might care about that. Now, some kids don't care about that much and we have to find other ways to help them find their own internal motivation, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not, this is never so simple. Like I know, I, I mean, most people who come to me have tried a lot of the things and they're not working. Yeah. <laughs> But, and I, it's usually because there's mo a more complicated picture going on, like, you know, but, but I think at the end of the day, what I'm always working with parents to do is like, well, where is your unique child at in this particular moment? Um, and like, we want to create an environment where each kid, based on their own interests and strengths and weaknesses, is being supported appropriately, right? Like we scaffold, we get them. It's important to help kids feel like we are going to help them kind of get as close to the finish line as they need to be. And then, but they got to cross it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And different kids need more and less scaffolding to do that. Some kids really need independence to be able to find the motivation to do that. Some kids need a lot of support 
And so it's, you know, there's not one way to do it. And I, and I feel very strongly about not giving parents a bunch of like arbitrary scripts to use or rules to follow because I, I believe a lot more in like frameworks and giving them sort of the foundation. Like if you understand how the brain and the body and the nervous system work, right? If you know what a threat response is, like, you know, when the difference between my child's got their prefrontal cortex, their thinking brain accessible to them versus my child's in threat mode, their amygdala, their threat detectors pull the fire alarm and they, they're in fight or flight. Well, that's going to inform where I'm going to meet them at in that moment. But like, and that's an in the moment kind of thing. But then when your kid is regulated, who that kid is, and maybe they have a learning disability or maybe they have a neurodive, you know, neuro, a neurodiverse brain, like maybe they have ADHD or maybe they have OCD or maybe they have anxiety or maybe they've had experiences that have shaped their sense of self and their sense of relationships in the world, right? Maybe they had, maybe they were bullied when they were younger and, and, and they get really threatened at school around new kids, you know, like maybe social situations are really scary for them. Like there's so many, everyone's so different. Everyone's so individual. They all have their their unique brain, their unique nervous system, their unique lived experiences. You have to take those into account as the parent to look, we said, look under the hood. Why is my child having this response in this particular moment in this particular way? There's gotta be a reason. And when I come into that exchange with curiosity, rather than I might be feeling frustrated, okay, that's normal, but I can validate my own frustration. I could say, yeah, this is frustrating. It makes sense to me as the parent, that's my self-talk, mm -hmm. but I'm coming at my child warm, not hot. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's going to help them feel safe enough to like, like start to share with us what they're struggling with in the moment rather than shut us out and not use our wealth of resources to help them problem solve, which is all we ever really want. We want our kids to want us to let us help them. Yeah. And that's being that safe, that safe person for them, like you were talking about. Yeah. We yeah. Have to see them. Yeah. We can't just have our own agenda. Yes. It's not yes. in relationship with them. Yeah. Well, Sarah, this was so good. Thank you. I mean, it's just so good. And there's so much to talk about. <laughs> and I want you to share about your podcast because they can hear more about secure attachment and how to do that with your podcast. And so tell our listeners all about what you're doing, how to find your website, you're on Instagram and you share your live videos. So let them know where do they find you? So I have a podcast called Securely Attached, which you can find anywhere podcasts are. And that's really about this foundational stuff. And then, you know, it's it's a lot of the content is geared towards parents of younger kids, but I have a lot of stuff that's very applicable to kids of all ages, right? Especially the teens and tweens, because when we're talking about regulation and the way the brain works, that is information and attachment relationships and attachment security that is all information that's going to be really relevant for these older kids. Um, I also have a, now that I think about it, I have a workshop that I have on my website called Be the Calm in Your Child's Storm, which is very much like a kid, a parent of all ages kind of thing, because it's really about this, like, how do we as parents self-regulate when our kids are driving us nuts, um, when they're activating us, when they're triggering us, so that we aren't gasoline on their fire. So that would be a good resource, the Be the Calm in Your Child's Storm workshop. Um, and that's on my website. You can find it at drsarahbren.com and it's under the workshops page. Um, B-R-E-N. Yes, D-R-S-A-R-A-H-B-R-E-N.com. Yeah. And if you're in New York State and you're interested in getting clinical support from, I have a group practice called Upshur Bren Psychology Group where we work with people, again, at all points on the parenting timeline. So we work with, you know, we work with teens and tweens and kids of all ages in person and virtually for therapy, but we also work with parents and we do parenting support. And if you're outside of New York state, we do parent coaching and, you know, you can come and do parent coaching with us as well. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing all the wisdom and uh, where they can find you. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Sarah. It's really lovely talking with you. And I, I really love this podcast. So I'm so happy to be on it.